I'm Johan Norberg, and I've been studying economic freedom for decades. What is it? And what impact does it have on people's lives? In the last 100 years, the world has created more wealth, reduced poverty more, and increased life expectancy more than in the 10,000 years before. Since the beginning of recorded history until the year 1800, the average person's income barely changed. But in the 200 years since, they increased by 2,000%. How did that happen? And what role did economic freedom play? I'm here in Montreal, Canada, outside the offices of the Fraser Institute, whose work on economic freedom has become the gold standard used by economists, researchers, and policymakers around the world. The Institute has developed an objective way of measuring the economic freedom of a country. And they've created a report that I've often used myself in my writings and lectures. But the economic freedom of the world report is not just about numbers and charts and graphs. No, it's really about people. People who want the opportunity to work hard, to become self-sufficient and independent, and to improve their quality of life. In 1995, this landlocked nation was one of the lowest ranked countries in the Fraser Report. But today, Zambia is one of the most economically free nations in Africa. In just 15 years, this impoverished African nation has increased its economic freedom to a level comparable to Poland and France, opening doors for people like Sylvia Banda. I started business at the age of 12. I was making fritters, and I put them in the basket, take them to school, I sell them to my friends, it would make me very happy. After working her way through college, Sylvia's first official business was to open a small, one-room restaurant. I didn't have anyone to go around and tell the people that uh, that particular day I was opening the restaurant. So I started frying onions, which I brought from home, the garlic and green pepper. And each time I uh, fry, fry, I cover it. Then I uh, put a bit of water, again I'll cover it, I'll allow the steam to come out, again I cover it, until uh, the whole place was covered with uh, steam. Then I went to the windows, I opened, I went to the door, I opened, and I could see the steam uh, rushing to go out. Very nice scent. Then five, ten minutes later, people started coming. Mm, mm, we have felt a very nice scent. At lunch hour, people started coming, and I was very, very happy. Then after some time, I saw that people were standing with their plates in their hands. Then I realized, I said, oh, I made a very big mistake. I had no tables and chairs. <laughs> Sylvia quickly realized there was more to running a restaurant than cooking food. But with no money, she had only her creativity. So I went to my neighbor who was in carpentry. I said, Patrick, supposing I started uh, giving you free meals, three every day, says in return, I said, in return, you make me one chair. So straight away, we started the butter system. From this modest one-room beginning, Sylvia Banda expanded her business to include extensive catering, a school for restaurant service workers, and the processing and nationwide distribution of Zambian foods. Her company, Silva Group, is now one of the strongest food service corporations in all of Zambia. In 2001, Sylvia's husband, Hector, left a successful executive career to join Sylvia's expanding company. She made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Since we're also getting on in life, I thought provided a good opportunity for us to grow old together. Enjoy. In 2010, the World Bank named Zambia one of the world's fastest economically reformed countries. Today, the people of Zambia are improving their lives in real and tangible ways. It was not always so. For over 70 years, the region was colonized by the British. Zambia became an independent country in 1964. The average African Zambian did their business on a sack in front of a store. They weren't allowed to be in the store, they had to be outside. So when the country became independent, the average Zambian didn't have any kind of economic business training. 
uh, they had to learn it on the go. Since African culture was essentially tribal and community-based before colonization, many Zambians saw socialism as a return to their traditional way of life. Kenneth Kanda was head of the Socialist Party, UNIP, and was elected Zambia's first president. He soon banned all other political parties and for nearly 30 years maintained absolute power. During his tenure, illiteracy rose, communal farms failed, foreign investment lagged, and Zambia was drowning in debt. Leaders grew wealthy while the majority remained in poverty. The first government, our president was not very much encouraging workers to be business people. Even those who had businesses, we were doing it with a lot of fear. Finally, Konda was pressured to reinstate a multi-party democracy. And in 1991, Frederick Chiluba was elected president. Chiluba shifted policy to focus on small businesses, property rights, and the privatization of key industries. The transition was difficult and corruption widespread, but out of this, a new Zambia was born. Private sector were encouraged to participate, to engage in uh, businesses, and to be proud to own property. So that also helped Silver Catering, which was a private uh, organization, to start looking into other ways in which we could promote uh, ourselves as a company that was serious about contributing to the Zambian economy. In Zambia, there was a time when we had droughts for two years. And this is the period where we started receiving relief food. And uh, people became handicapped. I think the dependence syndrome was quite high because we were receiving food from the government. People did not want to go back to the land. They wanted to continue just receiving the foods. So this is what prompted us to say, what is it that we can do? We decided to open a new company called Silver Food Solutions. Sylvia and Hector Banda's new business would focus on the distribution of locally grown Zambian foods. But getting produce from farmers in the remote countryside proved a challenge, as was creating a process to maintain modern standards for food quality. Then Sylvia discovered the breakthrough concept. She would ask the farmers to dry their crops at their own farms, making the produce more practical to transport. She would offer them training on solar drying, along with classes on hygiene. Regional non-profits supported by foreign aid had offered such training in the past, but with little result. Judith Muila worked with such programs. They would pay the farmers a certain amount of money and offered to train them and teach them certain techniques of preserving foods. But obviously that was not a sustainable way of training the farmers because for as long as the farmers were doing it for the purposes of gaining some monies, they were not doing it for the interest of it and also they did not understand how useful this would be to their lifelong skills. This time, a good crop with greater income would be the motivator. Farmers would not be paid for attending training sessions. But at the end of the season, if their produce passed inspection, Silver Group would purchase their entire crop. It was a major turnaround. Across all of Zambia, farmers who participated in Sylvia's new program dramatically improved hygiene and output. I'm a farmer. I'm here in my field at Kande. Since I've been born, uh, this has been my field. There's rice, as well as maize, uh, vegetables, as well as mango. It's important to teach farmers how to preserve mango because you'll find the, during December, January, mango just go rotting. Farmers will have money in their pockets. So the mangoes, as well as the vegetables, really they will have money and hunger will not prevail. Before we began supplying things to Silver Foods, my husband and I were farmers doing small gardens. My education is quite humble, and my husband's education is quite humble. 
We heard about Silver Food Solutions and did the training. And then they would buy our vegetables. Our way of life has changed. Before that happened, our children never went to school. We tried for a bit of time, but we could not find the money to pay. But once we finally were able to sell our produce and grow even more, we were able to send all our children to school. Our life is very different now. When we train, we visit them to find out how they are doing. They encourage us quite a lot, especially when you are talking about children who are very young. And you have heard that they have gone back to school. You become very, very happy. Today, we find that most of the city has Zambian-owned shops and most of the trade that is taking place on a retail level is owned by indigenous Zambians. So we've seen Zambians move every decade up the ladder of success to more and more complex business activity. Through the liberalization of the economy, through the encouragement of government for people to own property, and this is what is called the economic empowerment. Zambians now more than ever before are taking charge of their lives, which was not there before. Zambians are doing it for themselves, and the future is very, very bright. Yeah. 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 Yeah.